12.49 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm uh, joined in the studio now by Paul Gilding, uh, an author and environmentalist and campaigner. In fact, you're one of those people, Paul, whose business card could probably run to about 16 different pages. Um, and We're going to discuss uh, a number of issues, not least sustainability and the notion that, that the world is running out of stuff. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that a yeah. su- suitably Very layman good. way of describing things? But I want to begin mm-hmm. just by tallying with the conversation we were having just before with regard to Donald Trump, because um, all the other reasons to fear the fella, the environment barely mm-hmm. gets a look in, which is why I was slightly taken aback by, by this clip that someone sent to me earlier. My hair look okay? Got a little spray. Give me a little spray. You know, you're not allowed to use hairspray anymore because it affects the ozone. You know that, right? I said, you mean to tell me, because, you know, hairspray is not like it used to be. It used to be real good. No, in the old days, you put the hairspray on, it was good. Today, you put the hairspray on, it's good for 12 minutes, right? But, you know, they say that you can't. I said, wait a minute. So if I take hairspray and if I spray it in my apartment, which is all sealed and You're telling me that affects the ozone layer. Yes. I say, no way, folks. No way. Okay. And that is what you're up against. A great intellect, indeed. Potentially. Because his apartment is sealed. Mm. The chlorofluorocarbons? Yeah. I mean, the ozone isn't top of the list of uh, international emergencies anymore. But the... the, the And this guy could be president of America. You've got a lot of work on your hands. No question of that. But it's also this idea, isn't it? If I seal my apartment, if I seal my country... If I seal my mind from the world, it'll all be okay. Yes, exactly. And that. it's not. And that's, that's sort of part of this mentality of I, people like him can't comprehend that it's all connected. And, and that's why this, this sort of lack of intellectual understanding of basic science has left us with people like that. I don't know, he's not alone who believe that how could I possibly affect the global planetary system? I'm too small. It's too big. And that's, that's where we've learned to change the way we think. Where does the mm-hmm. resentment come from, do you think? Because it, it's not just, I can't accept that I've played a role in these enormous mm. environmental movements. It's, I really hate being told that I have. Yeah, and, and it's a combination of things going on there. One of them is, is don't tell me how to behave. Yes, um, that's that, that's in sense of freedom. I have the right to carry a gun. I have the right to do anything is part of the issue. But secondly, it is, it is basic science that is not understanding how the system works and how what we do does affect people around us. And, and that connectedness, if you like, I think is one of the underlying issues. And I think in the case of someone like Trump and, and the United States, um, you know, it's, it's what I argue in my writing is that this is fundamentally how we live our lives, which is about the economy. And change is not always threatening. He sees change as threatening. I'm saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had oil-free cars that ran electricity mm. that came from the sun that was cheaper to run and we had clean cities and we had more jobs? That would be a better economy. And so I sort of approach the issue saying this is a good idea. Having a cleaner environment is a good idea. We're going to be healthier. We're going to be happier. And, and they see it as a threat. Take away my coal jobs. Take away my lifestyle. You threaten me. And I'm saying, well, no, not acting threatens you. Fixing it up is actually good for you. This is the subject of your book, The Great Disruption, mm. and indeed the TED Talks that you do as you, as you travel the world trying to sort of encourage people to wake up to the reality of what you describe. If, if I was to try to put it into a sort of pithy little sentence, your fear is, and, and you back it up with a lot of evidence that the notion of infinite growth is bogus yeah. we're going to run out of stuff if, if you have an economy based on stuff yeah. you by definition have to run out i mean the earth is limited and yet, in, size. in a way modern capitalism is built upon the notion that we will never run out correct and right. therefore it's false and wow. therefore it has to stop. You're a cheery fellow. I am a cheery <laughs> fellow. But the, the good news is that when you face that kind of existential crisis, we can change. If I had told you typewriters were going to go or, you know, um, newspapers are going, etc. I mean, we do change. We change all the time. We have to change our economy. So it does have jobs. It does have pleasure. It does make our lives better. But it can't be built on more and more consumption of physical resources. We have to have a circular economy. We have to close the loop. We have to do things in a different way. It doesn't mean we don't have a good life. It doesn't mean we don't have growth in the economy and satisfaction and quality of life, etc. But the idea that, you can always, that we're going to have 7 billion people shopping like we shop, eating like we eat, without any, dis- any, any regard for the consequences, of course, is delusional. And, and delusions, in the end, you know, have to be called to account. What do the cracks look like? What do the cracks in the, in the, in the status quo look like? Look around. I mean, yeah. you know, Syria, um, yes, there's a, there's a kind of nasty guy running Syria, but there's also a really bad drought which caused instability and people to leave. We have the Arab Spring caused by food crises, caused by wheat prices, caused partly by climate change. We have <clears throat> all these system pressures that are building up. Inequality, I mean, Trump is not the problem. Trump is a symptom 
of the fact that the economy no longer serves the bulk of the people. That's an inequality issue. That's a sustainability issue. You can't have endlessly increasing inequality. You have to address it. What's the time scale then? Oh, I think I think it's happening around us now. It's it's like the but it, it, what, a fix the time scale of fixing things because the, the, you need to reinvent the global economy. And that's where you get into my kind of basic uh, sort of thesis of how we're going to respond is we wait for the crisis to erupt. You know, here we are in London, World War Two. Hitler didn't become a threat when he invaded Poland. Sure. Hitler was a threat long before that. We woke up at that point and reacted. And then we did extraordinary, impossible things in hindsight, you know, in the face of impossible needs to reform the whole industrial manufacturing system for the war effort. Unbelievable what was achieved. Extraordinary achievement and incredibly good outcome in that case. Likewise, in this one, there is no kind of too late in the sense that we can't overcome it. But the pain of change gets more and more. So my kind of call is like, we're going to change. We're not going to keep on warming the planet until it cooks. We are going to respond. But the sooner we respond, the better our economy is, the, the smoother the transition is, the less disruption there is. And that's the whole point about calling the book The Great Disruption. It's yeah. not like the end of civilization. It is the end of doing things this way. Things are disrupted. We change and we make a better life and we make a better world, a better economy. And that's the opportunity of acting earlier rather than later. But kind of earlier is running out of time. Well, what's the biggest obstacle to this? Uh, Because I'm thinking about getting the message out there. You're a great example of of, of modern technology and uh, and more traditional media. You write books, but you also give these speeches that that Mm -hmm. go viral on the Internet and stuff like that. And yet... I mean, it used to be the means of production, didn't it, that determined who was in charge. Now it's almost the, the medium that is the message, and, and most of the media is controlled by people who won't like your message because they're doing very well out of the way things are. Thank you very much. Yes and no. So yes, absolutely, for traditional media and the Murdochs, etc. Um, there's no question, though, that the sort of uh, distributed media of, of the social media allows us to change much faster. So an idea spreads in lightning speed. But so do bad <laughs> ideas. So, so the Trump Correct. movement has is, is, is got a lot of support on social media as well, and you can go on board and find that people who endorse your own post-fact world view. Correct, but also the good ideas also spread as fast, and yeah, that's our okay. choice. Yeah. And that's our choice. The thing is, we are choosing, yes, we can go into collapse and decline, or we can go into a more empath- empathetic society. That's a choice that we make, and, and my sense is that we are you know, a bit like Sanders versus Trump. They're both disruptive, they're both saying the system is broken, but with very different solutions. And, it's, and, they're, and they're kind of 50-50. It's not like Trump is dominating He's dominating the media. Sure. He's not dominating what people think in America. Like there is a sort of half of them supporting him, half of them supporting a Sanders-type alternative. So we're ready for change. We need the right leadership, the right context to to allow that change to happen. And we've got it going on in British politics. I know you've only been here for a week, but the current leader of the Labour Party is speaking up for an awful lot of people who just feel that things have gone over the cliff, as it were, that, 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 that you need now to have a complete redrawing, yeah. a complete rethinking of the ways of doing things. And he's getting something of a kicking from the media and, and uh, even from his own colleagues. But are these the people at the vanguard of political well, change? I, I think disruption is, is a good thing in that sense. It's unpleasant for the current kind of people in charge of yes. everything, but the disruption causes us to think more deeply about what needs to happen and then be ready for that big change. And that, I think, is the good thing about the, the chaos of Trump or in, in, you refer to the UK political kind of upheaval or anarchy of recent weeks, you know, that, that is like, hey, well, let's think deeply about this. How can we do things really differently that really does serve the people? We, we, I've barely scratched the surface. I could listen to you all day. And, and I know a lot of people listening now will feel the same. They can get your book, The Great Disruption. You, you've got a website as well. Yep, just my name, paulgilding.com. Paul Gilding with an I. Yep. And, uh, and, and the TED Talks are there yeah. as well and all Correct. that sort of thing. And, yeah. and where do you go next? What does Paul Gilding's life look like? Are you well, going back to Tasmania? I or? live in Tasmania on a farm in the far south of, of Australia, which is a very pleasant place to live. <laughs> Um, and have a, have a nice life and bring up my kids and, and travel the world saying, come on, guys, let's wake up, so let's the get way, to work. The way things are going in Britain and America, Paul Gilding, I'm wondering if you've got a spare room. <laughs> we shall, uh, we'll talk again. I'd love to talk yeah, at a little more length next time. It's been a real pleasure. Paul Gilding, as you've heard, you can access his website, just punch his name into Google and find out more about this book, The Great Disruption, which was described by uh, Tom Friedman, or rather prompted Tom Friedman in the New York Times to write, Ignore Gilding at your peril. Well, we haven't. It's coming up to 1 o'clock. The next voice you will hear belongs to Tom Swarbrick.